we're going to begin this morning by singing a song that is not in your bulletin. We do have words for you sing along, sing along in the chorus, and Marge and I will sing a couple verses interspersed. I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. The church is not a building, the church is not a steeple, the church is not a resting place, the church is a people. I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. And when the people gather, there's singing and there's praying, there's laughing and there's crying, sometimes all of it's saying. I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. Welcome, church. We gather together in person and through electronics, through the Zoom, and also later on, Others can um, watch the service and participate um, through YouTube. We gather together to worship our God, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We worship together to honor Jesus Christ, our Savior, Lord, our Redeemer. We gather together to worship the Holy Spirit, our Comforter and our Guide. We light the candle together today to recognize and give honor to God, <clears throat> to Jesus, and to the Holy Spirit, the three in one. May we worship together in spirit and in truth and in thankfulness for all God has done, all God is currently doing, and all God will be doing in our future, in our individual lives, and as a body of believers. Please pray with me. Father God, we humbly approach your throne today, thanking you that you have given us another gift, another day to worship you, to serve others, to pray for others. We pray your Holy Spirit's presence upon this service that the things that you want to lay upon our hearts, to open our minds with, to open our ears with, that we will be responsive to the Holy Spirit's leading, and that we will be obedient to what it is telling each of us to do individually and as a body of Christ. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. In the voices together on the screen, uh, number 129, Oh, worship our God. We're used to singing it, Oh, worship the Lord and the beauty of holiness. There's a lot of different words, so don't go thinking that you have this memorized and can sing it without looking. Uh, so we'll get through it together. Worship our God in the beauty of holiness, in the beauty of holiness, in the beauty of holiness. Maker of the starlight, 
beyond us, within us, from silence, holy wonder, you birth creation's chorus. Oh, glory, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. With joy we come before you and glorify your name. Oh, worship our God in the beauty of holiness, in the beauty of holiness, in the beauty of holiness. Amaze us, born of Mary, before us. Oh, glory, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. With joy we come before you and glorify your name. Oh, worship our God in the beauty of holiness, in the beauty of holiness, in the beauty of holiness. Oh, glory, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. With joy we come before you and glorify your name. And 433, this... Uh, we sing, Thou True Vine Who Heals the Nations. And that's just the tune we use for that. But with different words taken from the Apostles' Creed. Mm -hmm. I believe in God Almighty, author of all things that be, maker of the earth and heavens, keeper of the sky and sea. I believe in God's Son, Jesus, now for us, both Lord and Christ, of the Spirit and of Mary, born to bring abundant life. I believe that Jesus suffered, scourged and scorned and crucified, taken from the cross, was buried, true life there had truly died. I believe that on the third day Christ was raised up from the grave, then ascended to God's right hand. He will come to judge and save. I believe in God's own spirit, bonding all the saints within one church catholic and holy where forgiveness frees from sin in the body's resurrection for the breaking of death's chain gives the life that's everlasting this the faith that I have claimed. Mm -hmm. 
Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. You'll notice in the bulletin that there are two scripture passages mentioned. We will be reading from Ephesians 4, 1 through 16, which will be on the screen. The Acts 27 passage will actually be um, read and referenced through the message today. Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does the work. We have a sermon this morning from Jessica Schrock Ringenberger, who has been the director of Center for Anabaptist Leadership and Learning at Heston College for the last three years. Yeah, I, well, I think that's been phased out now, but uh, I think she was also she had a Zoom seminar a couple of years ago here about the effects of COVID on um, on the churches. And, I, and that was put on by Heston, I think. She was one of the moderators of that discussion, so she may look familiar to those of you that uh, participated in that uh, Zoom seminar. Uh, she was at Heston College with the uh, Hall Center for Anabaptist Leadership and Learning at Heston College for over three years. She was a pastor for over 14 years before that. Jessica is passionate about the church being sent into the world to create disciple makers where we live, work, and play. Oh, currently lives in the Kansas City area where she and her husband own a heating and air conditioning business, which they use as a ministry to their employees and to the community. Karen and I watched this sermon Friday and, and uh, we found it very challenging, so. And blessed by it. Yes. I'm Jessica Schrock Ringenberg, and I'm glad to join you um, this morning as we talk about the difficulty this difficult time and space we as a church find ourselves in. And um, to think about what it means for us as the church, uh, 2,000 years in the making, and and how often, uh, just to, to think through that this is not 
new. The church in difficult times is not a new thing. Um, and so to think through, like, how do we, how do we get through this time and space? We're going to go all the way back to the beginning of the church, uh, to the book of Acts. Um, and I'm going to start actually with Acts chapter 26, at the very end of Acts chapter 26. Uh, Agrippa said to Festus, this man, Paul, could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. But Paul was determined to go to Rome. Um, human beings, we are determined. <laughs> the book of Acts, also known as the Acts of the Apostles, really should be renamed. I would rename it, actually. Uh, I think I would name it the guidance of the Spirit. Um, the entire book has two great themes. The, the planning and proclamation and the work of the Acts of the Apostles and the direction and intervention of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. Paul was determined to go to Rome. Now, I don't know, um, planning, strategizing, preparing, all of those things seems to be a uniquely human characteristic. I mean, I, I don't think we really think about that because it seems obvious, right? But have you ever thought of animals? I'm sure do not have five-year plans. Uh, I'm pretty sure they don't keep schedules. I mean, the intricacies, the depth, the way we make plans can only be a part of the image of God. Because God, God makes plans. God has a vision. God has purpose. God has the long goal in mind. And I'm not talking about like a five-year plan. I'm talking about like, or, or a 20-year plan. I'm talking about eons. Eons. God is long. He, his vision is long. I mean, if you just think about God is a visionary. So was Paul. He had a plan, his plan to go to Rome to appeal to the highest authority, which would be Caesar. That was the plan. And he thought that this was what it should look like. I mean, that's what we humans do. We have plans. That's what we do. I served in a congregation for over the expanse of 14 years. And I can't tell you how many planning sessions, visioning sessions, mission sessions I participated in. And that was the long-term planning. I mean, that's not even including the short-term plans that it takes day in and day out to get through the, ch the church year. Like Paul, we were determined. We are determined. We want to know what's happening next. We want to know what's going on. What is, what is our purpose? So Paul sets sail for Rome. And already in verse 4, already it says the winds are against them. The winds are against us, actually, it says. He is determined to go to Rome, but the winds are against them. Now, this is significant language in New Testament Greek. As I said earlier, the Acts of the Apostles should also be called the direction or intervention of the Spirit. The Spirit in the ancient Greek language is pneuma. That's where we get the spelling of pneumonia with a P. Pneuma, lungs in the ancient language. And the word wind, breath, spirit, it's all the same. It's all the same word. This is significant because all through the book of Acts, it is the Spirit leading and guiding and preventing. This is significant. They want to go somewhere, but it says the Spirit stops them. No further explanation. It says the Spirit prevented them from going and then they went somewhere. It moved them somewhere else. The Spirit, it's the Acts of the Apostles, but the Spirit is the driver of this story. The Spirit is the driver of the early church. And now in Acts 27, verse 4, immediately the winds, or it could be translated spirit, are against them. The winds are making their plans difficult. Now, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say <laughs> that things for the church are difficult these days. We are experiencing unprecedented challenges that were only exacerbated by COVID-19. Like, the COVID pandemic, things even before that, things were bad. The winds are against us. Now, I grew up in central Kansas, and uh, let me tell you, I know what it means for the winds to be against us. I remember bicycling, and as soon as the moment you stop pedaling, that your, your bicycle stops, or running into a wind gust with your shoulders down into it, and then the gust lifts up, and you almost fall. It is hard to try to move against the wind. The wind, the spirit is powerful. In 2013, I had the opportunity of hearing from the Hartford Religious Research uh, Institute of Re Research, and 
they said that in the height of American church attendance was 1955. 1955. And it has been steadily declining ever since. We just weren't noticing it. The day of the wind being at our backs has been gone for a long time. But we are determined. We are human. I think we have a lot to learn from Acts 27 because they were determined to make it through, the, the, through regardless of the weather. Acts 27, 9 said, much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous. And Paul says to the men, I can see the voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to the ship and cargo and to also our lives. Instead of listening to Paul, they followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable for winter, the majority decided that we should sail on. Now, Paul had warned them. <laughs> he warned them and warned them, but they wanted to continue to do what they know how to do. They were determined. Now, I encourage you to read all of the book of Acts and, and take note of the Spirit's leading and guiding. But in particular, look at Acts 26 and 28. Just notice how often the wind, the wind and difficult, the wind prevents, the wind pushes, the wind sets off course. The wind, the word difficulty pops up so often. Sometimes the wind or the spirit can make things difficult. Now, I want to be sure that you're not hearing me say that God, the wind, the spirit makes bad things happen. Um, I'm not saying that at all. Actually, my mentor was killed in a tragic car accident and people tried to comfort me by saying maybe it was God's will maybe people will be saved through this it's like no don't say that don't say that in the midst of tragedy don't tell people that I think it's unhelpful and it's harmful in the midst of tragedy you just sit and you cry and you offer tears but what I am saying is God our God is the one who, even in the midst of tragedy, our God is able to make a way where there seems to be no way. That, my friends, is the Bible story. Where their story seems to end, God continues the story. God is the God of life, the God of resurrection, who makes a way where there is no way. Paul, so Paul, he's telling the men, you better eat up, eat well, you will need your strength. So as the story goes on, the wind becomes so strong that the ship starts to come apart and they begin to try to hold it together with ropes, <laughs> with ropes. Imagine in the middle of a hurricane, gale force winds trying to hold a ship in the middle of an angry sea together with ropes. That's desperation. And it's terrifying. Terrifying. But not, it's terrifying mostly because it still feels real today. Doesn't it feel real? Like we are just trying to hold the church together with ropes. Holding ourselves together. And it's at that point that Paul assures everyone. He says, this is his assurance, the ship is not going to make it. Assuring, huh? The ship is not going to make it, but the people will. The ship is not going to make it, but the people will. Now, I have to give credit to my one of my favorite preachers, Danielle Strickland, uh, formerly of the the um, Meeting House in Toronto. She she apologized when I heard it. Apparently, she had preached it before. She apologized for preaching it again. But I was grateful because I'd never heard it. Now, when she told this story, <laughs> the ship is not going to make it, but the people will. This is how I heard it. I heard, Dear Church... You are in a storm of unprecedented proportion. You were determined, you are determined to keep on going on your way all the way to Rome. But the boat you are riding in is splitting into pieces. And you are determined with all your power to keep it together with ropes in the middle of a hurricane. But God says to you, the people will make it. The ship will not. So my question for you as a congregation, who are the people? 
And what is the ship? Who are the people and what is the ship? Because the church is supposed to be the people. And if that is the case, you, the people, will make it. But what is the ship? Can you name the ship? Paul has everyone eat up. He gains strength so that they can make it ashore. In Acts 27, 35, it says, After this, he said this. He took some bread and gave thanks in front of all of them. Then he broke it and began to eat. And they were all encouraged. In the middle of a hurricane, he breaks bread, gives thanks, and takes communion. And when they had all eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. And when daylight came, they did not recognize the land. But they saw a bay with a sandy beach and decided to run the ship aground if they could, cutting loose anchors and letting go the ropes. They then hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach, but the ship struck a sandbar and aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken into pieces by the pounding of the surf. I love that. Terrifying. Horrifying. Can you imagine? <laughs> they did not recognize the land. Friends, we do not know where we are going. Nobody does. The ship, whatever is your ship, is going to wreck. It is going to be utterly destroyed. Its bow is going to be stuck into the sand, and the surf is going to tear apart the rest. But the church, the church will make it. The people will make it. But we have to begin to differentiate between the people who are the church and the ship. If we are going to thrive on a new shore. So people, if you are the church and you are going to make it, what then are you to do in order to thrive on the new shore? Earlier I said that God was a visionary and we could easily argue that perhaps, I mean, the greatest visionary, right? And we could easily argue that perhaps the book of Ephesians was given to the church as God's vision for who the church should strive to be in order to thrive and grow and become the fullness and the stature of Christ. Ephesians was written to describe the expectation of every new believer to strive for the purpose of unity. Chapter 4, it says that he, each, he gave each one of us gifts to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son, to the measure and the full stature of Christ. Now, this, my friends, is not, this is not a leadership text. This is not written just for leaders. These gifts are not given to a few. They are given to all. Each one of you, each one of you have a particular sacred gift for the ministry of the church. And when you discover your, discover and use and grow into your gifts, you have everything you need right here, right now. And these are the gifts. Some of you have been gifted as visionaries. You are project starters, networkers, builders of new things. You're always wanting to improve, improve, improve. We know these people. They are the movers and the shakers. In the Greek, it is the gift called apostello. It's the, the, the ambassador, the sent one, the apostle. Now, some of you have been gifted with deep insight. You are prayer warriors, the people who notice the flaws in the system and challenge what is not right. These people drive us crazy. They question the status quo. These are your prophets. Some of you have been gifted infectious invitation, infectious communication. You invite people to everything. You know those people who invite everybody to everything. These are the people that make sure everyone knows what's going on. They're the storytellers. They're the salespeople. The people, if they like it, they're going to make sure everybody knows they like it and they want you to try it until you buy it too. You know who you are. Those are your evangelists and we need them. Some of you naturally care for the community. You care for the sick and the sad. You genuinely care and have concern. And your biggest desire is to make sure the community has connection. You are shepherds, also known as pastors. And the rest of you, you have a gift of explaining so that others can understand. You are teachers. 
Now, all of these gifts appear in the regular world, but Christ made them holy for the purposes of the church, for the purposes of the people of God, for you. You are the church. You, you people are the church. The programs, services, building, and budget is not the church. You are the church. And you have everything you need right here and right now. That was God's vision. <laughs> that was God's design. Praise God and make it so. In the hymnal worship book, the blue book, 425, let's stand as we sing. Come, come ye saints. Come, come ye saints, no toil nor labor fear, but with joy wend your way. Though hard to you the journey may appear, grace shall be as your day. We have a living Lord to guide, and we can trust him to provide. Do this and joy, your hearts will swell. All is well, all is well. The world of care is with us every day. Let it not this obscure. Here we can serve the master on the way and in him be secure. Gird up your loins, fresh courage take. Our God will never us forsake. So our song no fear can quell. All is well, all is well. We'll find the rest which God for us prepared when at last he will call. Where none will come to hurt or make afraid, he will reign over all. We will make the air with singing, shout praise to God, our Lord and King. Oh, how we'll make the chorus swell, all is well, all is well. Yes, I found that sermon challenging, the more, more challenging the second time than I did the first. So um, she's quite gifted, and, and it's hard to discern how the Spirit's leading sometimes as we live in uh, confusing and, and controversial times. At this time, we'll put the uh, Bible memory verse, 1 Corinthians 12, 14 up. Um, if we'd read that together. Uh, that's our verse of the month. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. Corinthians 13, uh, 12. This time Larry has a song. Eight thirteen. heart with loving heart united. Heart with loving heart united, met to know God's holy will. Let this love in us ignited, more and more our spirits fill. He the head, we are his members, we reflect the light he is. He the master, we disciples, he is ours and we are his. May we also love each other and all selfish claims deny, so that each one for the other will not hesitate to die. 
Even so our Lord has loved us. For our lives he gave his life. Still he grieves and still he suffers for our selfishness and strife. Since, O oh Lord, you have demanded that our lives your love should show, so we wait to be commanded forth into your world to go. Kindle in us love's compassion, so that everyone may see in our fellowship the promise of a new humanity. For our benediction, I would like to read Romans 15, 13. <clears throat> May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. <laughs>